You know, we've been trekking through the book of Ephesians. And in the book of Ephesians, what we see are two major parts. That the first three chapters are all about who we are. That is who we are in Christ. And then chapters four through six are all about what we do, how we walk, the way that we are to live. And in the context of what we're talking about today, in Ephesians chapter 5, if you have your Bible, you can go ahead and turn there to Ephesians chapter 5. We'll start in verse 1 here in a moment. But there's this concept of the darkness. Now, I don't know about you, but whenever I was a kid, I was terrified of the dark. Terrified. And one of the household chores that I had was every single night, I had to take out the trash. And I was terrified. (laughs) The trash was around the back, dark side of the house. And I remember every single day, I would give myself a little pep talk, some evening affirmations. Bertie, you are tough. Bertie, you are strong. You are brave. You know, if someone comes, you'll just hit them with the trash bag. I was terrified. I had a a, a phobia. It's called, um, how do you say it? Uh, Nyctophobia. The fear of the dark. (laughs) Thanks, guys. Terrified. And I I would like to say, uh, not terrified of the dark, but of what is in the dark. Because there's an unknown nature of things around you when you are in the darkness. Here, thankfully, we can see a little bit. But whenever I was a kid taking out the trash around the corner full sprint to the trash, throw it in, run back, probably miss the trash can. I was terrified. And I like to say this is no longer true about me, but I'll let you infer. And today we're talking about this, that there's a significance of light. And as reflecting back on this fear of mine, for this morning, it got me thinking about some other phobias, some other fears that people have. Some pretty interesting ones. And I realized that maybe I have more fears than I thought, or at least irritations. So I want to see if you can relate to any of these fears. The, uh, the first one is, is this, and they're hard to say, and they're never easy. Uh, arachibutrophobia, which is the fear of peanut butter sticking to the roof of your mouth. Anybody? Yeah? Fear just annoying? <laughs> I don't know. Arachibutrophobia, the fear of peanut butter sticking to the roof of your mouth. All right, here's another one. Nomophobia, the fear of being without your phone. Mm. I know someone in my household, my wife, uh, does not have this fear because she loses her phone everywhere. Where's my phone? I don't know. <laughs> fear of being without your phone. Uh, how about this one? Uh, arithmophobia, fear of numbers. Didn't, didn't know about that one. Uh, this is a good one. Uh, plutophobia, the fear of money. And I'm just telling you, I need to find one of these people. <laughs> because if they are afraid of money, just let me take that fear away. <laughs> so if you have that, let me know. Plutophobia, the fear of money. Here's another one. Uh, xanthophobia, fear of the color yellow. Interesting. Here's one that um, maybe your kid has, a blutophobia, the fear of bathing. Anyone with a, a, a middle school aged student? They all have a blutophobia. Uh, globophobia, the fear of balloons. Coolrophobia, the fear of clowns. In fact, you guys wanna see a picture of a clown? No? <laughs> no, <laughs> sure don't. A uh, fear of clowns. Uh, a phytophobia, or sorry, a arachnophobia. You guys know what that one is? Fear of spiders. A phytophobia, fear of snakes. This one, be patient with me. Hippopotamostrosisquipopolidaliophobia, which is the fear of long words. <laughs> and that's just mean. So. I did my best. Hippopotamonstrosis squipidaliophobia. The fear of long words. Um, uh, Aphidophobia, the fear of adolescence. Anyone terrified of teenagers? Yeah? Poganophobia, the fear of beards. 
I don't really have to deal with that one much myself. Here's one that I see a few of you out there might, might have. Uh, looking at your heads, no comment. Chetophobia, <laughs> fear of hair. Yeah? No? All right. <laughs> Vestophobia, fear of clothing. Please no. <laughs> Ergophobia, the fear of work. Here's a good one just to summarize them all. Uh, phobophobia, the fear of phobias. You know, for me, it was the darkness. The darkness is uncomfortable. Something that is uncomfortable at not being able to see the things around you, to see what is going on around you. And as I mentioned, we, uh, we have been going through the book of Ephesians. Ephesians 1 through 3, all about this idea that we are to be in the world, but not of it. In the world, but not of it. What does that mean? What does that look like? For you to be in the world, but not of it, as John 17 says, I would say this is something we get wrong all the time. You know, we think that we just want to surround ourselves with the light, as we'll talk about here in a moment. But there is darkness in this world that we are to engage, that we are to push back. In Ephesians chapter 5, we see again that we are to do three things. Three things that we'll come away with today. You can write these down. Which is to walk in love, to walk in light, and to walk in wisdom. That if we are to be in the world, but not of it, we are to walk in love, walk in light, and walk in wisdom. But what does that look like? Starts in Ephesians uh, chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. To be an imitator of God is to change our mind toward the focus that God has for our lives. And to be imitators of God as who? As beloved children. You know, it's amazing how much kids will follow and listen to everything that you do, except for the things you tell them to do, right? In fact, the other day, um, I heard this story of someone. It definitely wasn't me. Um, but this person had two daughters, the age uh, three and one, named Evelyn and Olivia. And, uh, you know, there's a song playing on the, on the little sound system all through the house, and it was a song that my, uh, this person's wife, <laughs> dang it, this person's wife told them not to play because the kids repeat everything. And so I'm just listening and I'm like, ah, it's not a big deal. She didn't really repeat everything yet. And there's this part in this song that just yells the F word for this person that listened to this song. It wasn't me. And uh, Evelyn just yells it out with the song. And I'm just, oh no. But it repeats everything. Imitating everything that goes on in the house. In fact, uh, we have two dogs, Brody and Luna. Uh, I think you can see a picture of them up here. This Brody is on the bottom, Luna is on the top. Uh, Brody and Luna, we've had them for a long time. Now, Brody and Luna, uh, actually just, just Brody, he has a phobia, uh, autophobia, which is the fear of being alone. And so when we get home, when we're taking the dogs outside, I have to leave the back door open for him to go in and just know that if he needed to, he can come back inside pretty annoying, but it would do that. And so after a while, thankfully for us, we have dogs on literally every single back neighbor that you could have. So they all talk to each other. (laughs) And so after a while, I get a little tired of it. And so I will go outside and I will try and get the dog's attention. Now, I don't know why I do this, but I just make these weird grunt sounds when I'm trying to get the dog's attention. Does anyone else do that? Just me? Okay, cool. That's great. But uh, Brody and Luna, and I'll just go out there and say, Brody, Every time. I don't know why I say that. I just do. It's the weirdest thing. Rudy. Hmm. Whistle a little bit. But what's hilarious is now Evelyn and Olivia will do the same thing. Look on there. <laughs> yeah, you don't really sound that bad. But kids repeat. They imitate everything that you do. 
Why? When they're in proximity of you, they start to take on your characteristics, the things that you do. And so in Ephesians chapter five, it says, be imitators of God as who? As beloved children, being mimickers of who God is and what he has asked us to do. So how do we practically do that? Well, the first thing, as I mentioned, is to walk in love. Continuing in verse two, it says, and walk in love. Just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. But immorality and any impurity or greed must not even be named among you. It is proper among the saints. And there must be no filthiness or silly talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know with certainty that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers in them. To walk in love is to put aside these things. Immorality, impurity, greed, filthiness, silly talk, coarse jesting. There is action, that as we walk in love with those around us, our language changes as God changes our hearts and our focus turns to thanksgiving. So in other words, how can someone see something different within you if you sound and look the same as everyone else? We put off the ways of the old and on with the new that God has for us. And when we reflect back on the life of Jesus, he walked in love in every situation, every circumstance, attentive to his surroundings. And when we consider what this isn't saying, is it isn't saying to be overly conscious and worried about every little word or thing that you're about to say. This isn't talking about curse words. But it's talking about being attentive and aware of your surrounding, finding opportunities to walk in love. Through things that you are taking in and to those that are around you. Walking in love. You know, years ago, I had this uh, person on my team, on, on my staff team is at a church and we would get together pretty regularly um, and we would pray together in the mornings with the team, just, just, just gather together, pray about the day, what's coming up, what's happening. And uh, this particular coworker, uh, she found out that she had cancer. And so she had been battling cancer for quite some time. And so we'd been praying for it. And as she continued to go and get tests, uh, it all seemingly went away. We praised God for the miracle that had happened. She was hopeful, helpful, uh, hopeful, excited, thankful of what, God was doing in her life and the cancer was gone. But after a while, it it had come back. I remember her just trying to wrestle through what this looks like, what this means for her. And there's one morning again, we we gathered together for prayer and uh, I wasn't really in the headspace to pray. I wasn't really thinking about it. I wanted some base level prayers, you know, like let's pray for this football team, you know, like just kind of go through the motions of it. I was actually j- joking with a f- friend of mine that morning about something that happened in football the week before and just not, not really present in the moment. And as we started, she jumped right in and she started to pray for this n- niece of hers that was a baby that was in the hospital having a hard time. And I'll never forget this. She, she then said, and God, I, I also want to pray for her. And she just paused. She started to cry. And then feeling embarrassed, she said, just, just someone else go. And in that moment, uh, as a leader, I felt it was my responsibility to end the awkwardness. And so I just moved on. Moved on to something else, prayed for this other couple as we continued forward. You see, and in this moment, I wasn't walking in love for this individual. Why? Because I wasn't present in the moment. 
You know, we go through our life every day and we may be physically present here, but our mind is elsewhere. And when we consider the idea of walking in love, what it is, it's to be present in the very moment that God has put you in. But we spend so much time focused on the past that we can't change and on the future that in a lot of ways we can't dictate. And so to walk in love is to be present in every moment that we find ourselves in. Making the most of those opportunities as Jesus made opportunities for those that were seemingly insignificant. And I just wonder if I was focused on the things of God that morning, would I have responded different? I could have taken a moment to pray for her. You see, when we cross paths with people every day, we have no idea what they're going through. And I didn't know for her that she just found out that she had a timeline of how long she was going to live. But here I am, I just feel like it's awkward and I want to break the silence. She knew she was only going to have a year, maybe two left. A moment to walk in love. When we consider what it looks like to walk in love, again, it's not being overly conscious of every little word that we say, action that we make, but it's to overall being present in the moment that is before you. To not be so focused on the things of the future, the things of the past that we miss what God has put right before us, right then and there. In fact, even as I was preparing for this yesterday morning, I was putting my notes together. I got a couple texts about some urgent prayer requests that were needed. And I was sitting on my back porch working through this. And in a moment, I I just felt like, "Ah, I'll get to that later. I'm just going to ignore it because this was more important to me. And as I continued to read along, I kind of had a heart check, right? Being present in the moment as the opportunity presents itself. And I don't know what that looks like for you. Maybe it's for your kids that you dedicated this morning. You spend so much time with them, but when you get home, you're exhausted from the day. And so you throw on a show. Body is present, but your mind is elsewhere. When we walk in love with the people in our lives, there is a presence, a proximity. And we talk about a kid mimicking their parent, doing the things a parent does. It's because they are in close proximity to the parent so they can see the things that they do. And we miss opportunities to be present in the moment, to walk in love. The next aspect is to walk in light. Continues in verse eight, for you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. For it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. But all things will become visible when they are exposed by the light. For everything that becomes visible is light. For this reason it says, awake sleeper, arise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. The second aspect of being an imitator of God is to walk in light. And this is a key to understanding what it means to be in the world, but not of the world. We or to be the light. But the problem comes that we love to live in the darkness. We find fun in it. We find a freedom in it. Things that we know that God would not want of us in our lives. That thing you do behind closed doors that no one is around to see or know. That secret that you've been holding on to. We love to live in the darkness but we are to walk in the light. It says you were formerly darkness. Former, not current. Walk in light. And there is nobody that has continued to pursue darkness that has found satisfaction in it. In fact, I found this researcher uh, from Australia. Her name is Diana Kinney. 
And she studied the lives of 12,665 popular musicians, rock stars, and rappers to see if their lifespan shortened their life. That is people who have essentially unlimited access to anything that they could want. Anything and everything they could ever want to pursue. And it doesn't take a research study to understand that is not going to end well. That the lives of many of these people come crashing down as they continue to pursue the ways of the darkness. And this isn't to knock all musicians and all popular people. But there is a a correlation between living in the darkness without restraint and what it results in. And what she found is that the average lifespan of a rock star, a popular musician living a life of partying, drugs, and drinking, all in excess. Their lifespan was shortened by an average of 25 years than the general public. Not only that, people who have access to everything that they could want, they should be happy, right? They should find fulfillment in their life, right? I know for our lives, we can think, if I just have this, if I just have that, if I just have this, then things are going to be okay. People who have access to everything. What she found in her research is that the suicide rate was seven times higher among this population. 700% more likely to end their own life. Because life isn't found in the darkness. It's found in the light, but the light can be painful. And I want to ask you, What good is light if it's surrounded by light? The the lights on around here, how effective is this lamp? It doesn't do much. Because for the light to have power, for the light to have impact, it needs to be close to the darkness. Light covered by light is ineffective. And when it says walk in light, we see nowhere in the Bible does it say that you should avoid darkness at all cost to protect your light. When it's talking about light, it's talking about the impact, the influence that the Spirit has given to you as you have followed after Jesus. That you have something to share with the people around you. And far too often, we decide that we want to protect it. We want to come to church surround ourselves with Christians and just huddle together protecting our light. But that is the exact opposite of what God has called us to do. To walk in light is to step into action. To expose the darkness as we step out into the world. Going to church is great. Gathering together with other believers is great. But if the only relationships that we have in our life are other people who have their own light, then we are doing it wrong. Because the responsibility that followers of Jesus have are to push back the darkness. But you can only push back darkness when you step into the darkness. And when we talk about exposing the darkness to the light, it's not about sharing it in a pointed way, saying, you need to do this different. That's not what we're asked to do. Point, you're doing this wrong. You're doing this wrong. It's to be in proximity. That the way you walk, the way you are, the way you act, the way you talk, the way you do things, it looks different. Why? Because you're walking with the light. When we talk about walking in the light, that is the responsibility we have to push back the darkness. Not to just protect. How can you make a difference if you're not entering into the darkness, stepping into relationships with coworkers, with neighbors, with loved ones that don't know who Jesus is. Sure, we want to gain more knowledge, learn more about who God is and what he's doing in our lives. But if we are surrounded by light, 
what good is this? So to walk in the light is to be in a place where we push back the darkness by stepping into those relationships in our lives. That is what is meant here. To engage with the world while not compromising your beliefs. Don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying become the darkness. Because with the light comes parameters. right? This, this cord is only so long. Because I have a sphere of influence with which I'm able to step out with my light. That I can only go so far. Why? Because I have to be grounded in the source of light which is the word of God. It's not to step so far into the darkness that you become darkness yourself, but to step into the light to make a difference in the lives of the people around you. To be in the world, but not of the world, means you are walking in the places that the world walks, but you are not acting like them. You're not doing those things. You're not participating in the same way because there is something different about the inside of you. Life looks different. We want to walk far enough into the darkness to be a difference, but not so far that you become darkness yourself and unplug from the grounding light. Which is why the next aspect is to walk in wisdom. We have to be very careful with where we walk and what we do. Continue in verse 15. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And I get this question so often, what even is the will of God? What does he want for me? What does he want in my life? A lot of times we'll we'll look at it and we'll see this list of can do's, can't do's, I can't do this, can't do this. I got to do this, can't do that. But there's so much more there. In fact, when we consider the freedoms that God gives us, what his will for us is, is to flourish within the parameters that he set. And that is that true freedom comes with parameters. True freedom comes with parameters. There's a parameter in place for it. I think back to to my daughters. Just last week, Evelyn was sick like all week long. So we were at home. And she has full freedom for the house with the exception of a few things that we have in place. The bottom cabinets are locked because we have glass down there. We don't want her to break it. The scissors are up on top of the fridge, so she can't reach them. And my will for her life when she is at the house is just to flourish and be creative and have fun. When she's home from school, what I'm not doing is I'm not saying, all right, Evelyn, we're going to go upstairs and we're going to play with this tea set with your stuffed animals now. Okay, Evelyn, now we're going to go play with blocks. All right, Evelyn, it's time to ride our bike. All right, now I want you to go downstairs and I want you to actually play with this specific stuffed animal. And, and we laugh about that, but that's how we think the will of God is for our lives. Well, did God tell me to go play with my stuffed animal? Did he tell me to go take this job? Did he tell me to go move in this house? God's will doesn't work that way. Our freedom comes with parameters. That his will for our life is to flourish and understand his nature as we live with his spirit inside of us, walking in wisdom. It is never my will for Evelyn to draw with crayons on the wall. She knows that. How? Because we've talked about it. It is never my will for her to get the scissors and cut her hair like she did a couple weeks ago. Never. But how does she know the things that I expect and don't expect her to do? From time spent together. Do you see the theme here? Presence in proximity. Evelyn understands the will that I have for her life when she is at home because she spends time around me. Because she spends time 
talking to me. Now, does she always listen? Of course not. Do we? Of course not. Does that mean that God loves us any less? No. But true freedom comes with parameters. We just heard about life without restraint, what it leads to. These 12,665 people. That life without parameters is never truly free. Because true freedom comes with parameters in place. And as we mature, as we grow in our faith, those parameters look a little bit different. As we understand more of who God is and what he's doing in our lives, it looks different. But there's still parameters in place for us to walk toward. And if we want to walk in wisdom, if we want to walk in the will of God, what that means is that we spend time with God to understand the parameters of his freedom. How do I know what God wants me to do? I spend time with him. And very rarely are you going to hear, oh, yep, that's the house I'm supposed to buy. It may happen. But we have freedom to choose, freedom to live, freedom to create with the parameters that are in place for our lives. And all kinds of things can be God's will. And uh, many passages that the Apostle Paul wrote a lot of the New Testament, he talks about this idea of renewing your mind in Romans chapter 12, that when a Christian mind is renewed, you're able to cultivate the skill of discerning God's will, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And this comes with the caveat of what to be aware of as we walk in wisdom. Continuing in verse 18. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation. I want you to underline that. Maybe debauchery, dissipation. But be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Dissipation. The word that Paul's using here is something without restraint, without boundaries, without parameters. Do not get drunk with wine. Instead, be filled or essentially get drunk in the spirit. The correlation, the similarity here is that there's this outside influence impacting, affecting your decision making. To be filled with the spirit is to think about how to make the most of your time and the moments that you have to think critically about how to make an impact. How to be present with your kids, with your spouse, with your friends with your neighbors. To be filled with the Spirit is to think about how to make the most of your time. And I don't think it's just coincidence that Paul uses this in relationship to being drunk with wine. What is one of the primary reasons that people choose to get drunk? Because thinking about their life is too painful. You don't want to think. So you drink. You don't want to deal with that, so you drink. And how often, when you do that, are you critically thinking? Not much. You're doing the opposite. And it's crazy how fast time flies if you're drinking too much. Just swings on by. Oh, well, the day's over. We'll get it next week. Because when you drink, you're trying to not think. And Paul here is warning about what can happen. It is dissipation, without boundaries, without parameters. And you'll nowhere in the Bible see a complete prohibition of drinking. You'll see times it's used for celebration. Think back to Jesus. He goes to this wedding. He turns this water into what? The grape juice? Wine. To celebrate the goodness of this marriage that is about to take place. But you'll see just as many passages all throughout Scripture that are warning of the problems of alcohol and its abuses. 
Why is this in the conversation of being wise, walking in wisdom? Because alcohol is something you have to be very wise with. For one, it can be the celebration of friendship. For another, it is other, utterly destructive and foolish. How do you know that parameter for yourself? You know. You know. And so when we consider walking in wisdom, what we do is we step into clarity of mind as the Spirit continues to guide us. And even when we understand what is the Spirit supposed to do for me? What's it supposed to look like? How do I get filled with the Spirit? Is to step into the presence of the moment that God has put before you. Walking in love, being present with those around you, walking in light, being the light yourself. And walking in wisdom. Walking toward the things of God and away from the dissipation. The things that God has for you and before you. And it comes down ultimately to walking in freedom. We talk about we plead the blood at the beginning. That there's a freedom that we have because we have been sealed, we have been stamped, as we talked about last week. You can't unstamp something. You have been marked, you are set apart, different, as you've followed after Jesus, if you've made that decision. It says, do not grieve the Spirit by the decisions that you make. So how do we understand the parameters, the will that God has for our lives? How do we walk in freedom? By being in proximity of who God is, leveraging our sphere of influence to be the light in the world. I'm gonna leave you with this thought. That you are to be a light sharer, not a light protector. That when you consider what your responsibility is as a follower of Jesus, it's not to have your life all put together to be perfect, but it's to take bold steps out into the darkness, to hold your light up high, not to say, look at me and look how great I am, but to step close in proximity to others. Because how beneficial is this when it shines in the light? What good does this do for the world? That's not to say coming together is problematic. But don't just protect your light and hold on to it for dear life. God has something greater for you. To share it with those around you as you dedicated your child this morning to share it with them, your number one responsibility is to raise your children to come to know Jesus, who he is and what he wants for their lives. How do you do that? You become an imitator of God as beloved children. The same is true for your neighbors. Stepping into relationship with those that don't know who God is, and saying, I'm going to share this light, not pointed at you in judgment, but to walk close in proximity. You want to walk in freedom? You want to understand the will of God for your life? Then get in proximity to him, to his word, what he has for you. And you'll understand and you'll see what being the light is all about. Well, let's pray together.